Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your hot takes, your observations, your questions, and ultimately your comments about tennis or anything else I post on the YouTube community tab. Earlier this week, it is now Friday, and I am finally feeling well enough to do the mailbag. Yep, I have been uh, a bit unwell, and that is part of the reason why I've been not doing any content for so long. I uh, haven't done a show since the uh, Nadal versus Darwin Blanche post-match. So, I mean, here's here's really the timeline. So, on Thursday morning, some stuff with the body starts to starts to go downhill. I start to feel it. But on Saturday, I had this really cool opportunity to call the Pac-12 championships on Pac-12 Network Tennis, the Pac-12 Tennis Championships, which uh, if you don't know, if you don't follow college, Pac-12 is a conference that is disbanding. They have their own network, which unfortunately is going down with the conference. So this is the last Pac-12 championships ever. Uh, it takes place at a very, very historic tennis tournament that has been going on for 122 years called the Ojai which is in a, a very beautiful kind of quaint uh, coastal Californian uh, town as well. Somewhat coastal. It's a little off the coast. Anyway, so I'm, I'm really fired up for this opportunity. And I, I just kind of do this mind over matter thing where I, I can feel myself kind of getting ill. But I have to do this. Like, you know, it wouldn't exactly be easy for me to be like, Okay, I can't. You got to find someone else. Um, it's not something that a play-by-play -play person ever really wants to do, especially for like a one-off remote broadcast where travel is arranged and all of that stuff. Uh, um, and it was also a, a straight-out grind. It was a real grind preparation-wise for various reasons. And then when it was time, when it was the day of the broadcast, we did the women's championship. We did the men's championship probably on air for about eight hours in total. So uh, it was crazy, but I I was able to do it. I think at a pretty high level, it, it just took a lot. And I'm sure that didn't help me get better faster because again, mind over matter here. Like it was like, I have to do this. It doesn't matter what my body is telling me. And then, you know, and then I have the crash, of course, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, even Wednesday, not so much fun. Started to turn the corner yesterday. Here I am today, uh, feeling well enough to do this mailbag. Um, so that's my story. Madrid. I did get to watch a lot. You know, I didn't, I, I did get to watch a lot, but I wasn't waking up all that early for obvious reasons. And my level of attention and focus while watching these matches were not at my typical level, um, you know, falling asleep even sometimes. But that said, let's kind of run through it. Quick uh, Madrid monologue, and then I'll start with the questions. Second week has been kind of rough, you know, especially or I would say mostly because of the injuries on the men's side. It's it particularly hammered the bottom half of the draw. And it always happened. It always feels like this happens maybe once a year where there's a tournament where everyone's just dropping like flies. And, and then everyone comes in and they're like, why, why is this happening? Tell me, give me an answer. And I don't think there's usually a very good answer. I just think sometimes luck of the draw, there is a tournament that gets hammered with injuries. I mean, you know, when it happens, like, the week before a slam, like, you know, when like it happens often in Australia at, let's say, like in Auckland, for example. In that case, you know that the injuries probably aren't all that bad and the players are making judgment calls about being 100% ready for the, the next week uh, to play the major. But when, when something like that isn't at play and it, it's kind of at a random calendar spot, there's not much I can say as far as why are people getting injured in Madrid. I don't think it's the courts, you know. I mean, you can blame the courts, you can blame the balls, but you can't blame the balls in this case because these aren't like 
wrist arm injuries that we're seeing here. So I don't think there's a good answer. I think Sinner is the only one that can kind of be explained. And this is why I kind of explained it in my preview. I didn't pick Sinner to get upset or anything, but I was never going to pick him to win this tournament because I, I just got the feeling. And actually, he's even made comments about how Rome Roland Garros is really where he wants to make sure to be at his best. And because he's had to play so much tennis, a byproduct of all the winning that he's done, he was going to kind of he was going to kind of use Madrid as uh, an opportunity to get some extra fitness training in and maybe make some decisions about the way he was training that wasn't going to give him the best chance to play his best in Madrid, but was going to set him up really well for the next several weeks. And I think also mentally, there's something to be said for if next week is a tournament that means a ton to you, you're not going to be at 100 this week. It's always been like very, it was very impressive to me that Matteo Berrettini, who's, again, he, he loves Rome as much as anybody. It's where he grew up. Uh, it's always very impressive to me that he's done pretty well in Madrid. I mean, the conditions suit him, but I think it's tough for some of the Italians. Anyway, FAA has been the main bene beneficiary of all this. He has had two retirements and a withdrawal, which was the sinner withdrawal. And now he's in the final. I hope he plays with pride. I hope he feels like he belongs because that's going to give him the best chance of playing his best. And I hope he does play his best in the final against Andre Rublev. I won't go much further into that. Obviously, I will have Monday match analysis breaking down that final. FAA. Not the only surprise, you know, he comes through as an unseeded finalist. It's the second time in a row, uh, as far as Madrid is concerned, that we've had some pretty unpredictable outcomes. Lahechka with a breakthrough, making the semi. He had to retire with a, a back thing that I saw that he I saw that he had that right away. Uh, I think it was either the first or the second game. I saw him grimace. And I was like, whoa, that's not good. And then it wasn't. A couple games later, it was not good. But that's a breakthrough that I think was due. I was happy to see that because Lahechka has gotten stronger. His serve's gotten way bigger. And when he's at his best, he's hitting a massive ball in this altitude, in these lively conditions. Really difficult to deal with. I'll talk more about him because I'm going to talk about Nadal in a moment. But... Uh, I, I thought this was a breakthrough, again, due. Not overdue, just due for uh, Yiji Lehechka. Fritz, he got to the semis. He was serving great all week. He beat Sarindolo, who beat Madrid-loving Zverev. I didn't see Sarindolo Zverev, but uh, yeah, that's uh, he's been really almost impossible to beat here for anybody if you're not a top player. So good on Francisco Sarindolo. Then Fritz took him out. Uh, he played Rublev in the semis. Rublev performed phenomenally. He beat Alcaraz. He beat Fritz. He came in to Madrid on a four-match losing streak. I put him on upset alert for various reasons. And uh, he play he's been playing totally suffocating tennis. And I, I feel like the main thing that's turned the corner for Rublev is the return. Again, I don't want to talk too much about it because I know that I will go in-depth on him likely um, on Monday match analysis, and I'll I'll talk about stuff more. But the way he's returned against Alcaraz and Fritz is the biggest thing to me that's been above the norm for Rublev, where he has gone he has gone into the red, so to speak, and performed at a level in that area. Just the return of serve at a level that that I would not expect in altitude conditions. The best part of Madrid has been the or was the the mini Nadal run, which was I think everything that you would have wanted or could have wanted or could have asked for, uh, other than you know a poetic Roland Garros run. If, if you're a Nadal fan, um, it, it's been it was the kind of mini run and the kind of matches that I think everybody was hoping would eventually happen at some point this year for Rafa, 
where, uh, you know, he was, he was out there and I don't know if it was just me, but at times you kind of forgot about the circumstances and forgot about the injuries and you were just watching Nadal play tennis. And, uh, that in itself is a wonderful thing. I am not surprised that he beat Alex D. Menor. I am not surprised that he was able to back it up and beat Pedro Kachim because, and I keep saying this, from an eye test standpoint, I think he is still a top five offensive baseliner in the world. And that just comes down to ball striking and point construction. And the baseline variety he brings, and the decision he made, the decisions he makes, and the arsenal that he has from the back of the court. I still think he's a top five offensive baseliner in the world right now. And you're gonna win matches that way. You just are. Now, there were other problems. He seemingly, until this tournament had a problem after the hour and a half mark of maintaining his level. His serve was making it necessary that in order to hold, he just win a bunch of baseline points, which is, it doesn't matter how high a level you're bringing from the back of the court. That's never going to be ideal. And those two things kind of also played into each other. The lack of serve was making things more physical, making it more difficult for Rafa, but he had been showing flashes in all of his matches all year long, including the loss in Barcelona to Alex Di Menor, where he played with him for a set. And then the question was, are you going to make, or was he going to make the, the leap forward physically? And he did. And I think that comes down to playing into shape and certainly like the, in the traditional sense, how when you put your body through things, your body becomes more conditioned to do those things easier and better the next time. I also think there's a mental thing because there's a real fear factor for a player who keeps getting injured over and over and over again, where sometimes all you need is also the confidence that your body is going to hold up. So going through those two matches in Barcelona and coming out the other side, feeling by all accounts good it's going to embolden Rafa to push a little harder the next time. And that next time was Madrid. And he pushed a little harder, and his body seemed to respond really well. So, you know, the level has been there. Eye test has been passed in that respect. How long can he play for? That part got better. I think there's still probably work to do because the first time he had to play back-to-back -back matches, there was a little bit of, let of a let-off in explosiveness, although I'm not sure how much he could have done in that Lehechka match. And then is the serve acceptable, right? And it's not a high bar, but is the serve acceptable? And that is also, in my opinion, getting closer. I think it was bigger than it was in Barcelona, quite clearly, actually. Now... Yiji Lehechko was, was off the charts. Again, he hits a massive ball. His serve is heavyweight. He did a really good job, better than all of Nadal's other opponents, of going after returns. You know, he, he stepped back in the court. He bought himself some time. And, uh, and he really put a lot of pace into his returns. And that stifled Nadal's plus one quite a bit, which, which came up big. And Lehechko came forward really well. So all in all, if you look at the big picture, that was just a matchup where Nadal needed to defend a whole lot more compared to his previous matches. And that made a big difference, I think, in combination with the fact that, you know, you did have a physical cumulative build. Rafa having played his fourth match after a three-hour match against Kachin without the day off because he had a day off every other time. That was always going to be a tricky one. So that's Nadal. Overall, huge positive because physically... Massive strides, huge improvements there. And that's really what you needed to see. To Rome. Let's go to the questions. First one is from uh, S4. Do you think Rublev has reached his peak? So there was a point in time where I thought, yeah, yeah, I think he's reached his peak. I think we pretty much know who he is. He's been in the same kind of ranking area for quite a bit of time. Uh, that was probably 
period of time between 2020, where he had an awesome year, and uh, and 2022, you know. But then I think midway through 2023, he wins the Monte Carlo title. And then from there, I'm looking at Andre Rublev last year, and I'm noting quite a few improvements. And I, I think I said this on my end of year podcast with Gruskin. I was really heartened by the season that he had last year. I felt like mentally there were big improvements. And what does that even mean when I say that? It just means that in big matches, all of last year, I came out of those matches and I, I thought, Andre played his best. That's it. Andre played his best. He didn't necessarily win. You know, he's still outmatched against some, some of these guys. But I felt, okay, he played well. Which was not always the case. He patched up his weak, weak, weak second serve. And he made it, at the very least, average. I still think he's bulking up that shot, that second serve. But that was a big deal. And I think he's gotten quicker. And I don't know if he's still getting quicker, but he looks quicker around the court. He's still not someone who wants to play defense. But it still helps him when he's moving laterally to get to those spots earlier, to to hang in rallies longer, to be a little bit stronger. And, you know, even I think he's a tough guy to drop shot uh, because he does stay up on the baseline and obviously stays on top of you, and now he's pretty quick moving forward also. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think he's someone whose defense is, or his movement, I should say, is super exploitable, and I do think he's gotten quicker. Um, and then the big thing that I've seen this year is he's hammering his backhand down the line with super high frequency. He's hitting his backhand down the line, and I'd love to know the the numbers for this, and maybe I'll I'll uh, try to dig those up. But I feel like he's taking his backhand down the line as much as anyone now, and it's just made him even more offensively overwhelming to play against. Now, the Dubai incident is kind of this line of demarcation in his year. He had, a, he had he was good in Australia. That Demon Orr five-set win, that ages really well. That was a great match, one of the best of the year. And w- was playing pretty well in February, then has the Dubai thing, and then goes on a four-match losing streak. And now he has this rebound. I, I'm also wondering, because remember, the first thing that I said when the Dubai thing happened was, I wonder if this could actually long-term be a positive because he's going to start to look at his the way he processes things on the court And maybe he's going to think about some real changes in terms of how he goes about things. And maybe that might help his tennis. Now, I say this as someone who does get a little bit, who does get, who's a little bit critical of people who tie, you know, struggles that Rublev has to his temperament. Because if you look at his clutch numbers or if you look at his ability to to bounce back and win matches after losing the first set, numbers that I have looked at, they're actually very good. So Rublev is not the kind of guy who he loses a first set, he, you know, has a temper tantrum, goes into a dark hole, slumps for the second set and loses in straight sets. And and there are players like that. There are totally players like that. Andre is actually not that guy. So I don't like it when people make him out to be that guy because oftentimes he will blow off steam and and he'll he'll be ready for the next point and he'll play his butt off and he'll focus and he'll stay smart, make good decisions, and he'll play good tennis points after being really, really angry. Still, you can't convince me that it's the optimal way to compete. There must be there must be a way for Rublev to think more on the court um, and to handle stress and pressure better on the court than than what he's been able to do in his career thus far. And I think it's something that he he did think about. So I don't know what the Dubai thing is going to be long term, but I still think it could be good. 
I still think he could get quicker. He could hit his second serve bigger. And I'm curious to to know how that backhand down the line development will go. There's obviously other things in the variety department that people have been saying Andre Rublev should add to his game, could add to his game for for years. And that's the stuff where I'm like, eh, like, yeah, in theory, like he could start hitting drop shots. He could start coming forward, but I don't know if that stuff is ever going to happen. I still think he can improve um, without doing all that. I think Rublev is close to his peak, but I don't think he's reached it. Next one is from Jake5134. If possible, could you give us a lowdown on how players qualify for the Olympics? How many players each nation gets? Women and men singles. Also, how have Zhang Jingzhen and Facundo Diaz Acosta already qualified for the Olympics? Many thanks, Gil. I hope you're feeling better. Thank you. Uh, thanks for asking this because if people don't know this, I would like people to know this. It's uh, definitely important information. So, uh, first of all, the cutoff is, um, I believe, June 10th. I hope I got that right because I didn't write that down. But yeah, yeah, French Open, May 26th. Yeah, June 10th. So, here's how it works. The draws, and I'll just talk about singles. The draws are 64. 64 draws, no buys, which is a format that I very much like. We start with 64 players. There are 56 direct acceptances based on ranking, ATP WTA ranking. But you must be top four in your country because that is the max per nation. So you can be inside the top 56, but if you are the fifth best American, you are out of luck. You do not qualify because... Uh, you know, unless one of the top four U.S. players in this example were to choose not to play the Olympics or get injured, and then that fifth person will get in. So that is the most basic way that you can qualify for the Olympics is be in the top 56 in the rankings come June 10th. Um, now, the ITF reserves six spots for what they call ITF places. Four of those are winners or finalists of continental competitions. So you have the Asian Games, you have the Pan American Games, and you have the African Games. Those have all already taken place. That is why there are four players who have already qualified for the Olympics. It is the winner of the Asian Games, Zhang Zhizhen, the winner of the African Games, he is Moez or Moez uh, Ekargui from Tunisia. And then you have the gold medalist of the Pan American Games, Facundo Diaz Acosta, and the runner up of the Pan American Games, uh, Tomas Barrios Vera. So those are the four players who have already qualified for the Olympics, and that is why. Two other ITF spots are reserved. For, a, for former Olympic or Slam singles champions. The only uh, add-on there is that they have to be top 400. So Murray, Vavrinka, team, all major champions. Uh, none of them are top uh, 56. There's like a fruit fly here bothering me. Uh, none of those players are top 56. They will likely all be wanting that slot for kind of legacy, the, the legacy slot that the ITF has reserved. And then there are two spots that are said to be universality places. That's what it says. Uni or actually, I think it's one spot. One spot is a universality place. I don't know what that means. That is what I have read in the, in the rules. I have seen that on the official Olympic website. I have seen that on Wikipedia. I do not know what that means. So there is one Olympic slot. I it is It beats me. I do not know. There's one other thing I should mention. A player, in order to be qualified to play in the Olympics, theoretically, must be 
uh, must be kind of considered an active participant in Billie Jean King Cup or Davis Cup. Anyway, I believe that if you have completely blown off Davis Cup, Billie Jean King Cup for the last several years and you don't have a long history of playing it, um, you might be in trouble for Olympic qualification. I think there are exemptions, and that's why I didn't really want to talk about this right away is because I think that a lot of players might be able to get around this because you can appeal, I believe, to the ITF and try to get an exemption, and I don't know how liberal they're going to be with those exemptions, but technically, you uh, should have played internationally and represented your country, I believe, within the last three years in order to technically qualify for the Olympics. So hope that everyone, everybody is clear on, on that now, other than that mysterious universality spot. Next one is from Husky Plays. Hi, Gil. Mensik, Fonseca, Caboli, Kazo, and Nardi are all young players trying to break through on the tour. Could you rank them in terms of potential based on what you've seen so far? Thanks as always. I'm always a little bit cautious, a little bit careful with this just because I'm still gathering with these players, right? It's, it's very, very early on. But right now my ranking would be Mensik 1, Fonseca 2, uh, Kazo 3, Nardi 4, Kaboli 5. Right now that would be it. The reason Mensik over Fonseca, because I adore them both as prospects. I am really high on both of them. It is just for the simple fact that I know that Mensik right now has a game that's going to translate across surfaces where Fonseca, weakest part of his game is his serve. Can't be said for Mensik. And he's, you know, from what I've seen, he is playing from really deep in the court. And he's got really long swings. And I know that at least right now, he requires a lot of time. And I think he can get, I think he can be rushed. And I haven't seen him on other surfaces, which has been a, which has been intentional on his part, is that he has wanted to start his pro career on clay where he's most comfortable because he, he is valuing the idea that success on tour is going to give him confidence, which is smart. He doesn't, you know, he had no interest. He turned down wild cards at Indian Wells and Miami. He was offered them. He could have played those events, Masters 1000 events, but he felt, I don't want to rush the process here. I am not used to that level. I am not used to changing surfaces. So it's smarter for me to stay on clay stay at the challenger level. I'm still getting used to that level of tennis and try to get some wins under my belt and pick up some momentum. And then when the tour goes to Europe, then I will start to play some of these higher level events on clay. It'll give me a chance to really do myself justice and have some success. So I haven't seen Fonseca off clay. That's the main reason why Mensik who I know is ready to play on all surfaces right now. Mantic is over Fonseca in that ranking. Then you have Kazo. I love his serve. I love his athleticism. Um, and he's solid off of both wings. My my main question mark for Kazo right now is does he have enough wow factor off the ground? Because I don't look at his forehand or his backhand and say, oh my God, that's elite. Like that is incredible, right? It's nothing, it's nothing to be amazed by off of either wing. That is usually, usually great players have one or the other where you say, oh, that's special. Off of one wing, you're special. And I, I haven't seen that with Kazo yet. And that's why he's third for me. I think he's below Mensik and Fonseca mainly for that reason. Nardi, I... I'm not completely like sold. I, I love his forehand. Uh, you know, he has that nice kind of solid bunty backhand. Uh, he he's a big he's got good size. He's uh, you know, a big definitely a big like pro tennis body, good pro tennis body. So those are all good things. I just nothing nothing that I've seen out of him which is not enough. Again, like I need to kind of qualify it with I have not seen 
Nardi enough to really feel awesome about evaluating him. But that's where I'm at right now. And then Kaboli, I'm still figuring out what his identity is as a player, and that's why he's fifth for me. I don't feel like I have him figured out yet. Which, it could be my fault. It also speaks to him, because he probably hasn't figured everything out yet in terms of how he likes to play, who he is as a player. I don't know that he has that identity. And when you don't have that identity, it's hard for me to like close my eyes and, and see it. And right now, yeah, I'm not I'm not at the point with Kabali where I really understand exactly what he's trying to be or who he's who he is as a player. Next one is from member Lindsay Andrew. Thank you for being a member. You can hit the join button on YouTube. It is a two dollar per month contribution to support the channel. Goes a long way. Much appreciated. And I uh, try to hit you up as much as I can when I am selecting mailbag questions. I've noticed a pattern starting to emerge with Yannick that he looks more injured when he's down. Then we'll go up. Uh, then he'll go up in the score or get ahead and suddenly look way better and stop questioning to his box about what to do. See the Kotov match in the second set. This seems somewhat common in tennis players. Feel like Novak has taken heat. Uh, for this for years. Any insights here? Is it gamesmanship, subconscious, any documented sports psychology about feeling more physical pain when you're mentally stressed about losing, etc.? Thanks for the great content as always. I think there are probably uh, a plethora of reasons. Um, most obvious being when you're losing, Human nature is to look for a reason. Why is this happening? Like that is that is the most basic reaction to losing. Why is this happening? So if you're feeling pain somewhere, you know, that's your why. Like, and you're gonna hyper fixate on that. Every time you lose a point, you're gonna be like, my effing hip. Like that's how it's gonna be. And then when you're winning, you're not asking that question anymore, and um, and therefore you, you're you're less likely to fixate on something that's bothering you. Um, do you feel more physical pain when you're when you're stressed about losing? That that seems reasonable. I, I know there was a reply that says you know yes, there's a lot of science that has confirmed that. I, I would assume that's true. Uh, pain tolerance is a difficult thing to study. I know that, but it, it also, it has been studied plenty and I, it is not something, it is not something that is immune to being affected by variables such as, are you feeling, you know, positive like dopamine or, or dread and stress. And I'm sure these things are going to affect your levels of pain tolerance. Um, is there gamesmanship? There's definitely some gamesmanship also. Like, I don't think there's anybody, if you ask people on tour, I don't think there's anybody who's going to tell you, uh, that their opponents have never decided that because they're losing, they're going to kind of make a little bit of a show about their injury. Like, I think that happens on tour without, without singling out anybody or any specific circumstance or, uh, example. It's just something that happens. Um, yeah, then there's also just the, the matter of do players, are players taking painkillers that are kicking in and then the pain is going away or are they getting treatment that is effective and making it so that the pain goes away? And is that something that you're seeing? So all of those things are things that, that I think could play in. Next one is from another member, Paul Rubenstein. Hot take. The quality of play at Madrid is worse than at most other tournaments. Lots of mistakes and uncharacteristic errors. Guessing it is a combination of the clay and the altitude. You agree? Well, I, 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 can, I can buy it. You know, I haven't. It's, that hasn't been a thought that has entered my mind while watching Madrid. I will tell you something that has entered my mind while watching Madrid, which is 
I don't feel like they're moving very well. All week I've been watching, thinking like, they're not moving well. This is hard for them. So that's the main thing that I've noticed. And I think that has manifested itself in players aren't necessarily defending all that well. And you look at the semifinalists, right? FAA, Lehechka, Rublev, Fritz. These are all players who try to avoid defense. They're all players who serve big, hit big. And I, I don't think that's a coincidence. I think it's been difficult to defend. I think this is more slippery clay compared to the other clay. And it makes it more difficult to move on. Plus, you have the speed and the altitude. So that's the main thing that I've been seeing. Next one is from Abhishek. Hi, Gil. Considering Rafa has been playing well tennis-wise, and the main issue right now is his fitness, do you think he would benefit from another break where he just focuses on fitness and getting his body in great shape before making a comeback? Although I'm sure it would be very difficult mentally. No, I wouldn't advise that Rafa do this. I mean, first of all, one of, you know, uh, lack of match play has been a problem for, for Rafa in the long term. So you don't want to do anything that is going to exacerbate that particular issue. I also think, you know, as much as you can work on certain things when you are off the match court, such as strength building, uh, first of all, I don't know where Rafa is at in his career in terms of his ability to push himself really hard in his off-court training. And also, you need to kind of simulate the, the, the whole kind of match fitness thing by playing matches. It's the only way to do it. So I think it's going to be... Uh, Important for Nadal to play as many matches as possible. I think that's going to be the thing that is going to be more important for his fitness uh, than anything else. Next one from AKC. Hegel, over the past couple of years, you and most tennis fans have given Kasparut a list of all the things he needs to achieve in order to prove himself as a top contender at big events. Something like win an ATP 500, beat a top 10 player at a slam, beat a top three player, beat a top 10 player in a big final. In the last year, mostly in the last month, he's ticked all of these off. I've also noticed he's considerably improved his back end down the line, the shot John McEnroe said he needed to do if he wants to win a major. As you suggested in your video regarding his Wimbledon preparation last year, he has also stopped prioritizing ATP 250s. He currently looks like one of the most confident and arguably fittest players on tour. So what do you see uh, his potential being for the rest of 2024? And what's the new checklist he needs to tick off? Love your videos. Thanks. Hmm. So, like, I, I know you mean completely well by this comment. You mean 100% you mean well. But I don't know, like... I don't know if I have given him a list of things he needs to achieve to prove he's a top contender. I think this stuff is pretty simple, right? He had a very interesting 2022 where it was it was finals, 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 finals. He took advantage of all the draw opportunity in the world. Two major finals, uh, Miami Open final, year-end championship final, right? Or was that was that just a uh, a semi? I think it might have been a final. Um, and then and then he had all these two hundred and fifty clay titles, right? I I wasn't like you got to win one of these to prove you're a top player. It's just he almost got to number one in the world. And it was just very unconventional. It's not his fault, but it was very unconventional. He he had never won above a 250. And he, he didn't really have signature wins at slams, I don't think. So, I don't know. I think going into the next year, I actually had faith in Kasparud that he was going to kind of prove that 2023 was kind of a, a building block. And that 
he was going to take another step forward in his game. And I think I, I picked him to finish year-end five, right? So I, I thought he was going to kind of build on that and maintain his status as, at the very least, a Tier 2 player. And then he fell off a cliff. And he didn't play good tennis that year, and his ranking was kind of saved by Roland Garros final. So I just I just take issue with the idea that, like, it's me giving him a list— because I don't think it has anything to do with like what I think he has to accomplish. I just think like th- first of all, the ranking spoke for itself. He dropped out of the top ten, and yes, in order to be a top contender at big events, you gotta you gotta maybe win one, right? Like you're not you can't be considered a bona fide contender at big events if you don't win one. And then once you win one, it, it kind of changes the story here. Um. But I wasn't really criticizing him for having not won one. I wasn't like part of that part of that choir. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, okay, your question here is, what do you see his potential being for the rest of 2024? I think if this were Formula One, <laughs> I didn't know I was going to make this analogy. It just came to me. If this were Formula One, I think it's it's an interesting sport, right? Because you have a couple of teams that they're trying to win that, uh, what's it called? What's it called? You know, the championship. They're trying to win the something cup. It's, it's, it's blanking. It's not carpenters. It's something like that. Um, you know, they're trying to win it all. They're trying to accumulate the most points at the end of the year. Those are... There are probably like, you know, three teams every year, sometimes two, and they're trying to win. And then there's the rest, and they might be trying to get be the best of the midfield. So we want to get that number four, right? So I just think as far as the as far as you break it up, Rude Rude's competition this year, in my opinion, is Verev, Titipas. Rublev. Am I missing someone? Zverev, Titipas, Rublev. Let me pull up the rankings to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Um, yeah. Those guys. I, I think those are those are kind of his guys. And if he can outperform them, I think he should feel really good about about what he did this year. I don't, to me, he's not competing in 2024. He's not competing with Djokovic, Sinner, Alcaraz, Medvedev. But if he can be better than everybody else, to me, that would be a great year for Rude. What's the new checklist he needs to tick off? I mean, it would be good for the hard court results to come back again. I think that's the biggest thing. I know he made a couple of finals to kind of, uh, get the wheels turning in that respect but make some runs at some of the at the hard court masters have some you know second week appearances at the hard court slams for sure uh you know get some consistency going we'll see where his ranking is at after Roland Garros you know after he has to defend that uh those finalist points and we'll see how he does in Paris because that's always going to be the most important tournament of his year every year. So that's all I can say as far as checklist is concerned. But ultimately, look, he's, he's, he's realized, let me just say one thing about his game in general, his actual tennis. He has realized that his defense ain't all that. And if he's going to be a defensive player, he's not going to be a top 10 player. He's going to be fine, right? He's going to be a pro, He's going to be a top 20. He's actually probably going to be a top 20 player if he's a defensive player. But he's not going to be top 10. If you want to be top 10 in your Casper, if you want to be top 8, if you want to be top 6, you have to be controlling, assertive, bullying with that forehand. You have to. So he's come on court now with that mindset. He's understood that this year consistently, and it's made all the difference. Our next one is from Coid19. 
Do you think Yannick has done enough to prove himself um, amongst the best players on clay and a contender for big titles on... Wait, so I don't know if you wrote this correctly. Do you think Yannick has done enough to prove himself amongst the best players on clay and a contender for big titles on the surface? Also, what did you make of the hip issue and his strange match with Kotov? I think I was like half asleep for that match. I'm not going to talk about it. Um, thanks and keep up the good work. Has he done enough to prove himself? No. He hasn't really done enough to prove himself. But I think it's going to happen very quickly, potentially, for Sinner. If he wins Rome, I wouldn't be surprised. If he wins Roland Garros, I wouldn't be surprised. But from, from a resume standpoint, he most certainly hasn't proven himself. His biggest title on clay is Umag. Uh, he he made a quarterfinal at Roland Garros in 2020. And I, apologies on my last uh, Power Rankings video for messing that up, um, saying that he had never made a quarterfinal in Paris. Uh, but that was 2020. It was a long time ago now. So, no, uh, there's nothing proven about it. But... I, Gil Gross, believe that he is a contender for Rome and Roland Garros, if that makes sense. From Chris. Hey, Gil, for almost one year, Echeverry has occupied a rank between 35 and 27. Whilst we can accept that the top 20 is crowded with talent, I'm curious as to why his progress appears to have tapered off. To me, this is largely because his shots look a tad underpowered slash lack penetration Relatively speaking, of course, for example, in a recent Chapeau defeat, he hit only seven winners to Chapeau's 28. Do you agree? Are any alternative or additional explanations available? Do you have any success, uh, suggestions as to what he needs to do to reach the next level in his career? Thanks for the great content always. Appreciate it. Yeah, I do have suggestions for Echeverry. I mean, he's got a pretty good serve. He hits... Pretty big and consistent off of his forehand and his backhand. I don't think he's underpowered. I don't think it's a power problem at all. And he, he moves fine. Good enough. I think he is too easy to play against. I think he hits the same ball over and over again. And really good players who have superior skill to him love that like they love that so i just don't think he's disruptive enough it's it's very linear it's very straight line tennis there's not enough angles there's not enough mixing of heights and spins and it's uh that is i think to me why despite him being a player who doesn't make a lot of errors who hits a pretty big ball off of both wings and comes at you pretty consistently from that respect and serves big and appears to be in pretty good shape. He does all these things really well. He does not come forward. You know, he, he hits a drop shot, but that's his only variation. And it's a forehand drop shot. That's like the only variation. It's the only way he mixes up the points. So I just think he needs to add some stuff and um, play less straight line, straightforward, one pace tennis. If he wants to take the next step. Let's end on this pretty fun one from Ron Robbie. Fun theoretical question. You discussed in a recent mailbags why Americans have big serves. Can you think of any other countries that you can apply similar collective reason reasoning and speculate? Why is that? For example, Serbia, uh, terrific all-rounders. Czechs are huge hitters. I mean, come on. Burdich, Lehechka, Mensik. Mahach, Swiss using one-handed backhands. Curious to hear your thoughts and see if commentators or commenters here can think of other examples. The why is tough. I can't really give you the why on most of these, but what you want me to do is, uh, is generalize. You want me to generalize some nationalities, don't you? So... Look, I, I think there are definitely some, some tennis country stereotypes. Uh, Spaniards, they're, they're grinders, they're machines, 
They grunt loud. They run a lot. They're in, cre- they're in great shape. They never miss a ball. But their serves stink. So that's like your Spanish stereotype, I'd say. I, I, I will say, you know, you can think of a why for, for Spanish tennis. Like, there are some major coaches like Luis Bruguera, Pato Alvarez, like some of the major academies in Spain that have kind of pioneered these philosophies, plus growing up on clay courts or playing on clay courts where uh, these things are not coincidences. Like Chris Lewitt, my coach growing up, he went to Spain to study their ways. And he'd come back and he'd be like, look, I I love these Spanish coaches, but they just, they neglect the serve. They neglect the serve way too much. So it's not a coincidence, right? France. French players are usually incredibly talented. They have distinct styles. They're creative. They do certain things exceptionally well. But usually they are highly emotional. They are not mentally usually players who just lock it in and are super consistent all the time when it comes to focus and effort and decision making. One more will end up around an hour, which is what I kind of like for a mailbag. And um, I do, I do want to talk about this. Okay, this is from Jamie Pettingale. Hey, Gil, always love the content. Did anyone see the crazy Mute Shang match this week? Mute was his usual controversial self and appeared to demand the umpire have a coffee be brought to him since he it was a night match to keep him awake. He also complained to his supervisor, demanding a crowd member be removed for jeering. Actually, the crowd member told him to shut up. Editor's note. He was also sprayed by a hose from another court being watered behind him and kicked off again. Uh, a half hour later, a fan in the stands gave, gave Mute a coffee at a changeover, and he rewarded them with a towel and seemed smug about the whole situation. I'm all for prioritizing the players. Uh, they are what give us the game, and they are the most important. But when do the players' requests go too far? Should there be consequences for Mute taking an unauthorized drink from a random crowd member and delaying the match so much? How can staff handle the line between being fair and penalizing obvious drama queen behavior? I feel umpires are so inconsistent in what they do and don't take from players, especially Runa being penalized in Monte Carlo. How can this be fixed? This match was on drugs. You got the coffee incident. You got the hose incident. The crowd member being kicked out for telling Mute to shut up. You got that. You missed... You missed the fact that Mute at 5 on the third set tiebreak on a serve ended up accidentally spiking his racket into the court because it slipped out of his hand and having no racket to play the point with. 5 on the third set tiebreak. Later on, he'd save a match point with a dead net cord winner. Luckily, because he didn't deserve to win the match after that, Jerry Shank prevailed with some big forehands down the stretch to uh, reach the finish line. I thought a lot about the coffee thing, and that's that's really what I want to focus on is the coffee thing. I don't think it's unreasonable for a player to ask for coffee. I don't think it's unreasonable for that request to be denied. But I do think that it comes down to how a tournament is staffed. And I think at any of the four majors... If a player, as long as they're willing to wait a decently long time, if a player asks for a coffee at any of the four majors, I believe that there are enough people who are, you know, there's a court attendant, and I think there are enough runners in it and all, everything like that, where if a player asks for a coffee, they get it. But at a smaller event with less staff, and in the case of this Madrid situation, by the way, it was like one in the morning, it's also um, completely reasonable 
that an umpire feels that their the personnel is not there uh, to to provide such coffee. Uh, what was most unreasonable by Mute's part is that he felt like nobody in his box could go get him a coffee because they had to watch the match. That is, that's silly. And look, he was being difficult. He was being a dick like most of the match, let's be honest. So, I mean, that is that, right? But to think like his physio can't go out and get him, get him a coffee is a little bit absurd, right? Physio doesn't need to watch every point in the match. As far as the fan coming out, and giving the ultimately giving quarantine the coffee. I don't think there needs to be a rule against that. But as a player, I I I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. That seems scary. I don't want to get drugged. I don't want to get poisoned. I would not trust a random fan giving me a beverage. But there doesn't need to be a rule against it. It's not like... There's no magic potion, right? People worry about performance enhancement. There's no like magic athletic potion where it's like, drink this. You're going to be awesome. Uh, that's, as far as I know, that's uh, even like illegal. Like electrolytes enhance performance. Sugar can provide energy. Caffeine can provide energy. But, like, I don't know of any substance that a fan might be able to slip in a drink that is illegal for a player to drink that's going to make them really good at tennis, if that's what you're thinking, which everybody freaks out all the time when, like, players, especially Djokovic, gets, like, a cocktail from his crowd. It's like, I don't, I don't know what substance there is that's, like, the magic performance enhancement substance that is both... Um, illegal like a like banned and also isn't like a normal performance enhancing drug like a anabolic steroid or uh an hgh or something that like you know obviously blood doping is not you know can't be through a beverage like again this technology that people like to imagine that makes you amazing at tennis because you drank something i i don't know about this maybe i'm naive but i wouldn't drink a random drink I am. I understand quarantine mute wanting a coffee. I'm right there with you, buddy. I bring coffee out on a court all the time. Does it help my hydration? Probably not. Do I think it's rec it's recommendable? No, but I do it all the time. I just like it. So I'm with you there, brother. But have your physio get you the coffee. Hope you enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time.